on the turn back the way back to the back. He's bummed. Gentlemen, as you know, we are here today to discuss the history of the Department of Urology at Johns Hopkins and the Brady Urological Institute. It's very fortunate that today we have Mr. William Dittish, Dr. Hugh Jewett, and Dr. William Wallace Scott with us. Mr. Dittish is one of two living individuals who was here when the Brady Institute opened in 1915. Dr. Jewett is, the, is a graduate of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, class of 1930, and finished the residency at the Brady in 1936. He's been associated with Hopkins Urology for 50 years and is well qualified to give us an overview of the period under Dr. Young. Dr. Scott succeeded Dr. Young in 1946 and was professor and director of the department until 1974. Dr. Scott has been here for 30 years. Dr. Jewett, I'd like to begin by asking you to relate the beginnings of urology at Hopkins, because at least in retrospect, I can't help but believe that some of the success that's been achieved here is due to the fact that an institute was developed in which, under one roof, patient care, research, and teaching took place. Dr. Jewett, would you tell us about the beginnings of the Brady Institute? Well, the Department of Urology housed in the Brady Urological Institute had its origin in humble beginnings. In 1895, there was no Department of Urology, but genito-urinary material was looked after in the outpatient department soon after the hospital opened by Dr. James Brown, who was in charge of the genito-urinary clinic of the dispensary. Dr. Brown died in 1895, at which time Dr. Hugh Hampton Young was invited by Dr. Halstead to join his residency staff, and Dr. Young remained there until 1898 as a, an assistant resident. In that year, Dr. Halstead asked Dr. Young if he would take over the position of the late Dr. James Brown as chief of the Department of Genitourinary Diseases in the dispensary of this hospital. Dr. Young accepted after having done some major operations during his sojourn on Dr. Halstead's service and felt qualified to assume this responsibility. It is interesting to speculate as to whether Dr. Halstead and Dr. Welch and others at that early period could have possibly envisaged the enormous impact this seemingly minor appointment was to make on the future of American urology. Dr. Young attracted the attention of the entire faculty by his ability and was soon promoted to the rank of associate in surgery with privileges to admit patients to his service in the Johns Hopkins Hospital. With the help of general surgeons who had been doing all of the urological surgery up to that time, Dr. Young gradually took over and did uh, urological cases. Throughout the country, uh, this was a rare uh, experience. Uh, general surgeons did urological surgery, and urologists confined themselves, for the most part, to diagnostic work in the dispensary and to the treatment of venereal diseases and their complications. Dr. Young, with the help of the general surgeons who reluctantly relinquished some of their material to him, and with their cooperation, soon built up a thriving service. He spent some spare time in the machine shops of this hospital of modifying certain instruments and developing others. 
Among those that he developed was the punch operation, the punch instrument, which um, served to remove, uh, under local anesthesia instilled into the urethra, uh, cicatricial contractures of the bladder outlet and median bars. It was not used on greatly enlarged prostates. Soon, Dr. Young had accumulated an impressive series of 157 successful cases without a death, and uh, the, this procedure was pretty well established. Dr. Young's travels abroad had convinced him of the desirability of having all of his urological cases assembled under one roof. He was particularly impressed with St. Peter's Hospital for Stone in London. And when he came back to this country, he pursued this objective uh, emphatically, but he wondered how he was to raise the necessary money. Early in 1912, James Buchanan, Diamond Jim Brady, appeared in his office, suffering mostly from bladder outlet obstruction. He had sought relief of his difficulty uh, from specialists in Boston and in New York, but he was not a well man and was suffering from urinary tract infection, diabetes, chronic nephritis, hypertension, episodes of angina, and um, marked obesity resulting from a well-publicized gargantuan appetite. After Dr. Young's examination, he thought that Mr. Brady was a suitable subject for the punch operation. He showed the punch instrument to Mr. Brady and uh, demonstrated in detail just how the instrument worked. Mr. Brady felt that he had little to lose and consented to having the operation done. On April 7, 1912, under a locally instilled solution of 10% cocaine, Dr. Young did this operation, punching out several large pieces of tissue from the bladder neck. Mr. Brady, after his recovery, was so grateful to Dr. Young that he consented to provide the necessary funds for the construction of the Brady Urological Institute in perpetuity on the grounds of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. On May 4th, 1915, the institute was dedicated. Ground had been broken previously in 1913, and in January 1915, the Brady opened its doors to patients. A testimonial dinner with the dedication followed, and Mr. Brady was quoted as having said, in response, the sky has never been bluer or the grass greener than it was today. The uh, Brady assembled an impressive a group of workers and was extremely fortunate in having obtained the services of a medical illustrator, William P. Dietrich, from the Department of Art as Applied to Medicine run by the late Dr. Max Bertel. And Mr. Dietrich was later to become a world famous medical illustrator who did much to promote urology in the Brady and elsewhere. Mr. Dittish, would you like to comment on the staff that was present when the Brady first opened? Well, they were interesting times. And when you have the brand new staff come into a brand new building at one time, everybody trying to make grade, uh, it was really, I, 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 will, I will never forget it. I, I remember so many things about the beginning of the Brady. That, uh, but there was a very lively interest in each other, a very nice 
feeling toward each other. When everybody was out there trying to do something worthwhile. Who was here? Well, it was uh, Dr. Garrity was the chief next to Dr. Young, and then there was Dr. Quinley, who was uh, who was in charge of uh, uh, experimental surgery, who was a marvelous fellow, a great sense of humor. And Dr. David Davis came down the lawn and as a pathologist. When the first floor where most of the activity, the clinical activity took place, I was well aware we had a own photographer. We had our own pathological laboratory down there in which they cut the sections. We had our own anesthetist. It was really a complete group of people fighting hard and working hard to try to accomplish something. It was a great experience. I'd like to try it all over again after 63 years. <laughs> Dr. Scott, do you have some early drawings that Mr. Diddish made to share with us? Uh, Pat, uh, we are fortunate in having a complete set of the collected reprints of the Brady. And not long ago, when thumbing through it, I came upon an article by William Quinby, who was director of uh, research at the time and later was professor of urology at Harvard, chief at the Brigham. And this was an article on the function of the kidney when deprived of nerves. And Mr. Dietrich was asked to make uh, uh, three drawings for this, and, and we have these uh, three drawings. These were made in 1915. You remember doing those drawings? I remember very well indeed. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mr. Bradle had been uh, um, contacted by uh, Dr. Quinby asked him if he would make the illustrations for him. At that time, I was a student under Mr. Brail, and uh, I'd only been with him about a year. And uh, he was occupied with some other problem, and he said that he couldn't do them, but he would assign me to do, do the, these illustrations for Dr. Quinby. So this was my first, my real baptism into urology and the Brady, and I came over at that time, and uh, th th these are shown to me now to haunt me, I guess, but uh, they were pretty hard for me to do. You know, more recently, Pat, uh, through the kindness of Sam Jamison of uh, El Dorado, Arkansas, we have the originals of the last two drawings that uh, Mr. Didi uh, made. And uh, happily, these will be placed in the William P. Didi's Museum of the American Urological Association. Well, Dr. Jewett, let's get back to the early days of the Brady. I wonder if you could go on with the story. Well, before World War I commenced for us in this country, Dr. Young was able to attract a chemist named E.C. White to work on antiseptics in the laboratory. And he studied a large number of them. They were all listed by number and they went to 253. But number 220 turned out to be very effective in destroying bacteria without damaging tissue. And this was known later as mercurochrome and was manufactured by H.A.B. Dunning and distributed commercially. But before Dr. Young uh, went overseas to join the AEF, he founded the journal of urology as a private venture in 1917. And the American Urological Association made it its official organ uh, later in 1920. Late in 1919, Dr. Young returned from Europe and resumed control of the Brady Institute. For the next 25 years, the clinic was seething with activity. There was a tremendous amount of clinical work going on, inpatient and outpatient, and uh, it was the first uh, complete clinic of its kind in the Western Hemisphere. The uh, work done was almost entirely clinical, and um, the operations were modifications of older procedures development of new ones, the teaching of students, and uh, the publishing of papers, which were mostly uh, on clinical subjects. It uh, might be interesting to recall that 
Emerson, more than a hundred years ago, wrote that an institution is the length and shadow of one man. The truth of this statement is amply, uh, is admirably demonstrated here. Young's vision, resourcefulness, accomplishment, and his subsequent cultivation and development of what he had produced justifies the carving of his name in marble. Thank you, Dr. Jewett. Dr. Scott, how did you find things here when you came in 1946? Uh, Dr. J.A. Campbell Colston uh, was acting visiting urologist in charge and had been since 1942 when Dr. Young was made honorary consultant. Uh, shortly after Dr. Young's death in uh, August of 1945, a, a committee, uh, a search committee, was uh, appointed to find his successor. And Dr. Charles Huggins uh, of the University of Chicago was appointed uh, professor. Dr. Uh, to succeed Dr. Young. Uh, Dr. Uh, Huggins took uh, several months in making up his mind and finally agreed to come provided the uh, division was made a department. Uh, he was to begin work uh, July 1, 1946. Uh, there was considerable consternation in March of 46 when Dr. Huggins decided not to come. A new committee was formed. Uh, I was chosen as professor to begin July 1 and actually uh, came on board in October of, of 1946. Uh, fortunately, uh, at that time, World War II was over, and there were a number of excellent men uh, desiring training uh, in uh, urology, uh, that is, resident training. The nucleus of uh, Herbert Brendler, uh, uh, Willard Goodwin, uh, Peter Scardino, and a year later, Dr. Uh, Hodges uh, provided the framework for an excellent uh, house staff. The senior staff was extremely capable and certainly capable of conducting all urologic procedures. However, the once productive research laboratory had uh, lost uh, Justina Hill, who had gone over to uh, uh, work with J. Earl Moore, the syphilologist. Actually, she was working in the School of Hygiene. The laboratory space itself was quite adequate. Uh, it needed uh, addition, some alteration and air conditioning to permit one to work there in the afternoons of hot Baltimore summer. Equipment was lacking, and I still remember vividly trying to persuade uh, Professor Blaylock to let me have $500 to buy a Evelyn photoelectric colorimeter, which was the first one in the area. I'm pleased to say that he did. Uh, having a doctorate in physiology, I was prepared to uh, establish a program in basic research. Uh, the following year, in 1947, these efforts were uh, strengthened immeasurably by the enlistment of Dr. Charles Tezer, a biochemist, uh, to help us. Uh, Dr. Tezer later became director of the laboratories and remained so until Dr. Donald Coffey, a biochemist, pharmacologist, oncologist, became head of the laboratories. When I look back over the past 30 years uh, and ask myself what we have accomplished uh, uh, in the laboratories, I believe uh, that the most important thing was the provision of the space uh, equipment, uh, animals, uh, some guidance uh, to young men in order to uh, permit them to do research of their own choosing. Sure, we made some discoveries in terms of how uh, androgens make the prostate grow, how 
pituitary uh, uh, substances potentiate androgenic action, uh, how certain steroids inhibit uh, androgenic action on the prostate, these now being called antiandrogens. But I think, uh, uh, at least to me, the most important thing uh, was to inculcate the scientific method in these young men. Dr. Scott, we've heard how Dr. Young founded the Journal of Urology in 1917. I wonder if you would tell us uh, about the beginnings of the journal you founded, Investigative Urology. I have great respect for your scientific contributions to the field of urology and feel that it's most fitting that you founded the first truly investigative journal in urology. Well, Pat, in uh, 1963, I had just uh, finished uh, 13 years as editor of the yearbook of urology, and uh, this job had lost some of its zest, truly. And furthermore, I always thought there should be a journal devoted strictly to basic research in genitourinary physiology and pathology. I decided upon this and uh, wrote down the names of some 20 uh, rather young people in urology who had certain expertise in various phases such as calculus disease, urinary infections and the like. And uh, happily, uh, the first 12 contacted agreed to serve on the first editorial board of investigative urology. In 19, uh, uh, 77 July, when I succeeded uh, Dr. Jewett as editor of the Journal of Urology, Dr. J. Gillenwater of the University of Virginia took over uh, investigative urology, and it is certainly in uh, uh, able hands. I think it has uh, uh, been a good thing. Dr. Jewett, would you tell us where some of the residents have gone after leaving uh, the Brady? Probably Dr. Young's greatest contribution, and the one of which he was the proudest, was the training of a house staff. And he was proud to have trained 38 residents, of whom nine assumed professorships of urology in various university centers. Dr. Scott, in 28 years, trained 14 men who took professorships in certain university centers at home and abroad. It is interesting to note that the great momentum given Brady urology by Dr. Young in the beginning has been sustained without interruption over the years. It is still in the forefront of the specialty, and judging from the quality of its present leadership, seems destined to remain there. Gentlemen, thank you very much. You've provided a splendid summary of the history of urology at the Brady Urological Institute, and I think it's most fitting that the discussion today was held in this room, the Hugh Hampton Young Library, on the fifth floor of the Brady Building. Because, as all of you know, in the near future, the entire Department of Urology and the Brady Urological Institute will move to a completely renovated Marburg facility. In that new setting, urologists and nephrologists will work together under a single roof. As medicine moves into the 21st century, it's likely that the field of urology will change. By relocating the Brady Urological Institute into a new setting, where the medical and surgical subspecialists can work together, we hope that Johns Hopkins will maintain its leadership in providing new pathways for patient care and resident training. Thank you very much.